those of you that don't know me, I'm Joe Jancy. I'm the chief in Peel. That is Captain Blanke with the police departments. Um, online, we have Randy and Adam Harden with the Wisconsin ATV Association. They are going to do their presentation first. I think they're doing it on basic state laws with ATVs and stuff like that. I, I haven't really seen their presentation, so I don't know. Uh, if they don't, whatever they don't cover, I will, and I will be covering the um, Keel specific stuff. So. Um, you have any questions for me before we start? No? All right, have at it, Randy. Okay, thanks, Chief, and uh, thanks for uh, inviting us to be part of this. Um, as mentioned, I'm the, our home office is here in Sheboygan, but we're the uh, Wisconsin ATV UTV Association. We have about 120 some clubs across the state. Uh, businesses are a part of the organization and that's the background that I thought would be helpful to everybody is to kind of give the big picture and then our thoughts of how the city of Keele and what's happening there with the new ordinance coming up and in effect in March how it might play into the uh, rest of the picture around the state. So with that I thought I would give you a 10 or 20,000 foot view if that's okay. Um, now I'm having trouble. Adam, there we go. I want to play this video if you can hear this. There's some folks having some fun. Fast forward for the last five years. Back in 2017, we had over 376,000 in the state. Looking at 2022, we have just over 472,000 in in Wisconsin. That means there are a total of over Let's look at some grand totals. Incident registration is 472,300. Those are the machines that are stored in the state that can be either from local residents or from other state people who have cabins or whatnot stored here. But we have to take a look at the annual trail passes. Trail passes are registrations that are for machines that are out of state coming into Wisconsin. That adds an additional 22,888 registrations. That means our grand total is 495,188 machines. That's current as of March 2022. We also have a five day trail pass system where people can come in for five days. That adds an additional 8,092, but that number changes every day. Let's put this into perspective. Back in 2003, the economic impact in the sport was $295 million based on the completed economic impact study. There were little UTVs back in 2003, and winter riding was very limited compared to today's environment. Today, we not only have two and a half times the registrations, we also have over 46,000 miles of road routes compared to the vastly smaller number of road routes back in 2003. Back in 2003, road routes were actually only used to connect trail systems together. Today, they're used for the vast network of recreation. Riders are also enjoying far more winter riding opportunities with the UTVs and their accessories. So if we take the 2003 economic impact total and multiply it by two and a half, we end up with over $737 million. However, we need to adjust that for inflation. Thus, with the inflation numbers, we predict that the industry supports well over $1 billion in economic impact for the state of Wisconsin. 
Aside from the economic impacts of our sport, we also impact jobs and job growth in Wisconsin. Our state is home to multiple factories that produce ATVs and ETVs. John Deere is a Oregon, Ferris is an Osceola. So we're both large scale manufacturing centers. We also have a large distribution center where Yamaha Crown Pleasant Prairie and Parks Unlimited are chain there. Finally, our state is home to many, many power sports dealerships around the state. Each dealership employs around 5 to 35 employees, depending on the size. We hope you enjoyed this presentation about the economic impact of ATV and ETV in Wisconsin. If you'd like more information, please check out the Wisconsin ETV Community Association's website at www.wakwa.org. Okay, so that uh is a year old now we don't expect that many machines to come into the city of keel but big picture wise that's how big the industry is and how it's grown and that's why i wanted to show you that part of that oops now moving on some of the things we do as a state organization so that the reason i say that if you need to tap into the organization or maybe you want to start a local club that's what we talk about here oftentimes clubs do form and uh, whether it's just with road routes or social clubs just know that that's part of what we do to help kind of speed that process up so a person doesn't have to make all the mistakes when you start a new club we've kind of been through that with folks we support existing clubs but everything we do which we, we really stress doing it in a positive way in an ethical way, uh, in an educational is, is in our uh, every part of our uh, business plan and organizational plan. And encourage people to be aware of the impacts we all have. So as we start riding on the streets this spring, uh, spring ever comes, you know, it's important that everybody keeps in mind that, you know, to do this in the most positive way. Now, we accomplish our, our goals we're constantly assessing the trends that are changing and we've seen lots of changes in the last three to four years i might mention this picture on the screen it was about a year ago i think april it'll be a year it was kind of a ad hoc uh, club out of new london in wapaka county that wanted to do a fundraiser for a local uh, effort there so they got everybody together and they put this uh, road we call road touring i'll talk more about that in a minute they went on a spring ride. It was all on road routes. They ended up at this restaurant that they're at there and had some raffles. And on the way, they went back and uh, raised some money for a good cause. A lot of our clubs do that. So how do we accomplish our goals in networking? So as I mentioned, we're always reevaluating on input we get from a lot of different sources. Of interesting note here, this is, uh, I'm actually in the back passenger seat the person driving is actually the secretary of tourism uh, ann sears so we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute but the other way we get information is you see these trail ambassadors that we have it's one of our highest noted programs uh, around the state so we're constantly interacting with people out on the routes and on the trails uh, we educate them we talk about what's right we actually become the eyes and ears for the chief and other people that you know build up a trust of what our ambassadors are all about and it's not unlike a um, you know somebody watching the storefront you know a, a walmart greeter for you say they're they're watching what's going on in their in their store we're watching what's going on out on our trails on our routes uh, we also do a print magazine for those folks that might be interested in joining we'd love to have you on board uh, so adam's the editor of that we have a e-newsletters we have a pretty active facebook page and we're always communicating with the public workshop not unlike we're doing tonight this actually in this picture is a workshop over to dealership in oshkosh every year we do two or three we've done some in madison we've done some in beaver dam around the state getting people together talking about writing answering questions uh, kind of just making sure everybody's on the same page there. And then our trail ambassador program, we're constantly doing trainings and patrols. And I'll talk again a little bit more a little later on in there, but there's many options and opportunities to interact with other riders when we're out there doing our activities. 
uh, talk about these walking centers. Now this picture that you see is actually on a route. We're next to a gas station up in Marinette County. Uh, the route goes right by there and then connects up to the trails. Our ambassadors are there with uh, our county rec officer. There's a local constable that usually joins us. And then often we'll have a DNR warden pop in and out. Uh, but we're showing people where to ride. We're talking about rules and regulations. We're just interacting with people. Um, it gives them a safe place to ask questions. This past year, we picked up another partner at these, uh, some of these welcome centers, Gunderson Health System. Uh, of course, they're interested in how to prevent injuries and they wanted to get into our network. So they are usually there and they have some different uh, uh, active questions and trinkets they give out to a lot of the youth. And then Adam, he runs the day-to-day -day operations of our Trail Ambassador Program and through that, we also are part of the Wisconsin Emergency Management, the state uh, program where uh, we are the ground support for the air coordination group. So this is a live picture from two years ago uh, up in Jackson County where we were doing simulations with the uh, guard unit. I think this guard unit was from Mississippi, uh, but we do different ones. Just uh, this January, we're up in Lincoln County doing a, a training with emergency management, a couple of fire departments, the county sheriff, and the Air National Guard or the uh, Army National Guard from West Bend had a medic fly up, and we were doing simulations. So I say all this just to say that people in watching this recording, if they're interested in becoming a trail ambassador, um, be it, this is another level of training but it, it does tend to blend well with our community involvement in fire departments and, and local police departments. Uh, every year we put on what we call our VIP ride. Anybody from Keele in the area and the county is invited. Uh, we typically have been doing this over in Adams County. There's a park over there called Deerfields Recreational Park. We invite every state lawmaker, their staff, uh, Department of Tourism, Department of uh, uh, natural resources, local tourism and economic development folks, and we actually put them on a ride. Our ambassadors do the lead and sweep riding, and it's a great networking opportunity to talk about the sport and activity of ATVs and UTVs. So the key there is, is this bullet point talks about is building trust and working relationship with many different entities around the state and agencies. Again, there's the Secretary of Tourism. We've had multiple uh, tourism secretaries, DNR secretaries, uh, and we do this, and I just mentioned that so that decision makers that affect the program understand what the sport and recreation is all about. Now, some of the other program partners we talked about, when I say registration, meaning the registration program, so we you know, put that sticker on the machine and the plate on the back, and the state DNR is by statute the uh, state agency that oversees the day-to-day -day administrative uh, positions of, of the program. So we do a lot of work with our DNR folks. There's different bureaus. For instance, they got a state forest, they got state trails and parks. There's a grant team, registration, customer service. And then the, the uh, bureau that we work closely with, Adam and I and our ambassadors is Public Safety and Resource Protection, which is the, the warden team, the Bureau of Law Enforcement, and also their outdoor skill trainers. So we're always looking for more safety instructors, DNR safety instructors. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that a uh, little more in depth here, but if anybody is of interest to uh, take on that, we would love to help you get connected with that. And then, as I mentioned all along, we do a lot of work with our Department of Tourism, who does the advertising, uh, and then there's a new agency within the Department of Tourism called the Office of Outdoor Recreation. So they get the data and the, the information for towns and cities and counties that want to know more information. And then of course, here's where Keel starts fitting into this thing. Our Department of Transportation, although we're not, as ATVs and UTVs, we're not a motor vehicle, we're a recreational vehicle that has the ability by state law to ride on roads, which is what your ordinance did or will be doing here March 1st. So we do have a relationship that we continue to build with the Department of Transportation. Uh, they built a web uh, specific link for us off of our website. It's on the DOT's website, so a lot of the questions there. So that's the third agency that we do quite a bit of work with. 
and then just bigger picture stuff that won't affect it in in keel there but we work with the federal uh, the u.s forest service has about 200 plus miles of trails up in the northern part of the state we've done workshops for our county highway commissioners uh, we worked with individual county land managers and the wisconsin county forest association wcfa we've met with county boards and made presentations Probably closer than any of them, we work with a lot of the Towns Association, the, the uh, lobbyists for the Towns Association and our group, although we're not professional lobbyists, we're pretty good at doing grassroots lobbying. We've done some work together. Um, just last year, we were working, able to pass a bill that made it clear that municipalities like Keel can, you know, if you choose to make changes, it was kind of vague in statute, so that's some of the things we worked with the Towns Association, and then such as yourself, different municipalities like the cities and and uh, that we're working with here. Here's a picture. We actually had a workshop for the Power Sports dealers. Uh, we had a bunch of dealers together as so we were changing some legislation and wanted to get input from them. And then associated businesses is another category of our membership: restaurants, campgrounds mom and pop, barn and grills, etc. In fact, we just did a seminar last fall over in the Dells for the Tavern League of Wisconsin. We had about 130 or so businesses that uh, wanted to know about ATVs and how to uh, you know, bring them to their businesses as well. So as that presentation earlier showed, we have crested the half a million mark for registered ATVs and UTVs. ATVs still outnumber UTVs in total registrations, but the growth curve is definitely on the UTV side. Dealers are telling us that they're selling eight to 10 UTVs to one ATV. Uh, so you can see where the growth is going. It changed the demographic. It changed, I think, why so many people want to be on roads now with the side-by-side uh, the -side or the utility train vehicle. But this is also interesting and why I wanted to bring it up. A lot of the first part of this presentation was talking about what I would call traditional trail systems, spring, summer, fall, dirt trails. That's still a main stay that is part of the economy uh, that really is driven by outdoor recreation, motorized outdoor recreation. Uh, it mentioned in that show about winter trails uh, growing more and more dual sport sharing. Now, there's only of the 24 to 25,000 miles of snowmobile trails if they were all open at the same time. Only about 4,000 of those miles are legal to have ATVs and UTVs on. And there's some that have just ATVs because of the weight difference, and then a few that have UTVs. Marinette County is a county, and Florence County to your north, that both of those counties are dual use on the eastern side of the, the state. But then as you look at number three here, we started using as that presentation talked about routes are needed. It was put in legislation back in the early or mid 1980s, because we knew we were gonna have to get over bridges and waterways and then start connecting to gas stations and restaurants uh, and lodging establishments. But then in 2012, when we brought the UTV into what they call a permanent registration program, that's where this number four came into play. So ATV or UTV route touring is what we're calling it. So in other words, you start in Keel, you may want to go up to Brilliant or over to Fond du Lac, grab a bike to eat at the restaurant there and come back. That's what we call touring. It's not unlike uh, motorcycle riding, which I ride as well, uh, but you're just sitting in your machine, you get a group together, it can be yourself, but usually it's in groups. And then the next trend that we're seeing develop is called overlanding. An example of that would be, in fact, our club president just outside of West Bend last year started in West Bend and went up to Michigan using all road routes and trails. Got up to Michigan, did the same thing, got over to Minnesota. He made it to International Falls and almost all the way back. He had blew a belt in uh, his, near his parents' house in Clintonville. So overlanding is possible with the advent of route systems like you have, and we see them continue to expand that way. Now let's get real, let's talk about some of the things I'm sure that the city's talked about and citizens have talked about is, 
is what about safety and crashes and, and the things that go with this. This information is straight from the Wisconsin DNR that we work with so much. So you see the top factor on the left there is non-fatal crashes where the category on the right is talks about fatal crashes. So always concerning to us, especially with the popularity of the side-by-side -side or the UTV is yeah, um, alcohol use, same as it is in cars. And just Wisconsin is one of those states that um, it's just an issue. But how does it affect us? As you can see, snowmobiling, ATV, boating, uh, all of these are recreational vehicles that we got to keep an eye on things. Uh, now I did update the 2022. The report isn't done yet from DNR, but 2021 was a bad year for a number of fatalities. Uh, a lot of hours of use out there, but they but they went down dramatically, which we're thankful for. A lot of it, we, we'd like to take credit for some of it. We're never sure when it comes to this, but uh, of the 500,000 plus machines registered last year on the ATV side, there was 11 fatalities. And one of them was actually a victim was a bystander, wasn't even on the machine, but the ATV hit him. And then on the UTV side, there were eight total uh, fatalities and three of those victims were passengers. And it's almost always because they weren't wearing their seatbelt, the machine flips over and then they roll over. So seatbelts are really, really important as well as being legal, they're really important for functionality. Um, of the 11 deaths on ATVs, three of them we know were alcohol use. There's three unknown waiting for the uh, BAC to come back. They pretty much expected uh, or that that will come back that way, but sometimes we never know. And then three of those on the alcohol involvement on eight of the UTV deaths. So something we watch very, very closely. It uh, is something that we, we want to always make sure that we're addressing issues. Um, here's the other thing that I, I looked at your ordinance. I'm really glad that we're following what we call state statute 2333, which says under 18, it's mandatory to wear helmets. We really encourage people to wear helmets all the time, ATVs and UTVs, but 11 of the deaths, nine of them were not wearing helmets. One of them was unknown. Um, and then eight of them, you see five were not wearing helmets and five were not wearing seatbelts. And there's another unknown. And keep in mind in some of these fatalities, they're drownings and they go through the ice. Um, we had one up in Iron County where it didn't go through the ice, but it rolled over in a river and the person didn't have their, their stuff on and couldn't get out. So they call it a fatality here, which it was, but it was also a drowning. Now I wasn't able to update the 2022 citations, so I've used the 2021s. The most common issue we have um, that citation-wise are youth under 18 not wearing helmets. As specified in your ordinance, uh, following state law, it's mandatory until you're 18. There's nothing magical, by the way, that happens when you turn 18 that you don't need a helmet, but we hope people will continue using those. And then for UTVs, there were 109 citations for not wearing seatbelts. Um, we do need to update, when I say we collectively, the Department of Natural Resources and our user group and all of us together, we're trying to update some educational programming on it with a, more of a UTV focus. Uh, the program is old. We're trying to get more uh, DNR safety instructors certified and do some other creative things uh, that we think are going to help us this way. One of them is a new program, I'm probably getting ahead of myself, called Ride Smart, but we're getting into the school systems. We just got a three year commitment from our partner with uh, Can Am or Bombardier to help us get into the school systems, more work with our medical field, and of course with our clubs and our trail ambassadors to spread the word of why it's important to be educated on what's safe and responsible riding. So the idea here is we got to continue the momentum. Every time we get a new location like the city uh, of Keel, we want to make sure that every opportunity for folks that want to get involved in a little different way and still get the ride. The ambassador program is one of those volunteer jobs where you do get the ride uh, and talk to people and build a relationship with the, the chief and, and others in your county. Uh, that's our key of our program there. And then we're really doing a new outreach program called Let's Ride in Wisconsin, where we're getting the businesses 
to say the same story as what our ambassadors and our clubs and our citizens are saying. Uh, for example, we had a couple of complaints last year, and one of them I thought was was uh, pretty unique. Over in the northwest part of the state, going from a trail to into a town to a, a bar and grill, the local uh, or the county rec officer had asked us to keep an eye going through town. The speeds were seemingly too high, so we our team put a couple of ambassadors there and was just hanging out and people would go by going fast they give the universal slow down signal with their palms down and so these riders got to that barn grill there and they told the, the uh, owner that they were getting hassled by the ambassadors the trouble ambassadors and um, i'll take that kind of complaint all day long where the owner should have said yeah you guys are driving too fast you need to follow the speed limit there um, so that's the kind of impact we can have. I thought that complaint was a good complaint to have. We will take uh, that every day and twice on Sundays as the saying goes. The other thing that we got to look at now, I don't know that this is going to affect you in Manitowoc and um, you know the county there because our rec officers, um, they get a reimbursement program when they're out on the trails. Uh, but it is concerning to us as the overall picture. The, we now have 37 counties involved that partake in this uh, reimbursement program, fully funded by our ATV registrations, and they've got a low reimbursement rate. In other words, there's more money going out than coming in, which you folks in the city would understand that, but we need to raise that. That's one of the things we want to do. And there we talk about between our county rec officers and this is not counting the chief and, and the, the, the city, but our county rec officers and our state wardens put, logged a little over 56,000 hours last year, which would be the equivalent of 20 full-time uh, folks out on the trail. And that's in addition to the 100, just about 100 ambassadors that we have, that's separate and above that, even though we're not enforcement. So we found out that the wardens were also uh, needing more hours put back in to theirs. So back in 2004, our organization went to uh, Joint Finance Committee and legislature and says, hey, our program's growing. We got to go from funding four full-time equivalents to nine, which we were really happy for at that time, but it's still stuck at nine. And, you know, back in 2004, we had about 5,000 miles of road routes that Video said 46,000. We're now at 52,000 and still growing in road routes. Uh, changes monthly, seems like weekly. So we got to make sure that we have the management tools in place, um, which is peer pressure, which is our ambassador program, and make sure that we have enough uh, credentialed as well for that kind of activity. Um, as it shows there, 52,000 miles, it's now 54,000 miles. <laughs> and about 6,600 miles of summer and winter trail systems across the state. Uh, so now, 17 years later, I guess it'll be 18 this year, we've more than doubled two and a half times our number of machines, but the numbers for state law enforcement on the warden side is the same as it was in 05. And then, the, again, probably not too much of a concern for this meeting in the city, but out on our trails, we want to make sure that our, our uh, folks out on the trails got updated equipment. Uh, as mentioned there in that second slide, I mean, the major, it's a major tourism driver. We're actually gonna be announcing a new commission of a new uh, study that we're starting this year um, to get a little more data on routes like you guys are gonna have, uh, overlanding, winter only type, numbers so that we can adjust accordingly to both management and and the things that we do to make sure everything stays on on pace um and then over the trail systems again for those of you that hopefully we get out on the trails besides your your routes there in the county and the city uh bigger machines more tr more traffic we're moving forward to get another additional 200 miles $200 per mile of maintenance on top of, of what we've got already. So those are some of the reevaluations that we're always doing. And keep in mind that since 2012, which is when the UTV program came into place, that's when we brought it forward to lawmakers, we tested it for four years, and then we said, let's make it permanent. We've 
the UTV we thought should have a higher registration than the ATV, but at the time, lawmakers said, let's just try it out and see. And we thought for sure that we would see people going from, say, two ATVs to one UTV, and that does happen. But then on the other hand, we've got people that would never buy an ATV, a straddle seat, put their leg over the, the seat. But they, those folks are now, they would buy a UTV. So it's just something we keep in mind. Right now, our funding source is self-generated, as it always has been. There is no general purpose revenue dollars used in our program. It's all generated by our, our registrations and, a, and a, a small formula for state gas tax. Um, the other thing is public outreach. And this is where folks here in Keele and the area, uh, it, it's critical to help the, the chief and the other law enforcement professionals uh, peer pressure does a really good job when it's done properly. And our trail ambassador program, we, we actually put that together with our warden force. There's a workbook training, there's a background check, there's monthly meetings. We do uh, field day training to make sure that we don't cross the line. We're really the, the eyes and ears, but mostly people just want to know that somebody's watching and they want to be able to ask questions of people. And that's a lot of what our clubs and our trail ambassadors do. Um, and businesses are important that they have the same message as our clubs and our ambassadors. So again, if there's a, a want to start some kind of organization up in your area, Adam and I would love to help you do that uh, and support that effort. Um, continuing on, there's more things, again, working alongside of enforcement clubs, other partners, businesses, it's all important that we all convey the same positive image. And our welcome centers this year, we've already got nine scheduled across the state. We do five regional rides. Our, probably the closest to you guys will be down in uh, Washington County. It's all on road routes. We do a meeting and, and a ride in Allenton. We're gonna be up in Marinette County. Same thing, we have a meeting. We have five regional meetings and rides. But there's stuff going on every weekend somewhere. And the advent of being able to jump on your machine from home in Keel and getting it connected up. I know we have a new club starting in Manitowoc County. We've been up to some of their meetings. Um, just like down here in Sheboygan, our clubs from Washington and Ozaki County are working with Fond du Lac County and connected them all together. So we're getting over on Lake Winnebago in the wintertime. Uh, in the summertime, there's winter only trails on here. So I, I could foresee the same thing happen up in your area uh, with some leadership. That, might develop um, and then we just continue to have strategy sessions so if, you, if issues come up um, not that we have the answers to everything but we've seen a lot of different things we're always available to help or support the different uh, you know agencies there at the city and and beyond that's what we do that's i guess our value is that experience and some of the things we're doing, just for those that may be interested, we, as I mentioned before, we're, we've got some legislation being presented now in the state budget to increase our, our county law enforcement aids as well as our, our uh, uh, state warden force. And we're also doing a uh, rate per mile, as I mentioned. And then this mentoring program that may interest Keel, uh, the idea is to attract less experienced riders where maybe you go to a place that's new to you. It might be another city might be you want to go up to Wapaka County there was some good riding there it's all roads there but where do you park where do you ride where do you get gas that kind of thing so we started this thing called let's ride in Wisconsin we're just we're going to test it out with three different locations this year to start with and make sure that it uh, we make the adjustments but it's how to get people uh, into the program into the rides when new riders and see existing riders doing dumb stuff. I don't know how else to say it politically correct. Then if you don't have any correction to that, the person just tends to think that's the normal and it's not. So it's important that we have a, a program in place to address that and that's what uh, you wanna make sure that you keep what you have there opening up in the city and beyond. So that's what our mentoring program is all about. And then we've got our businesses. We, Adam is heading up another program uh, to, to better be able to plan your trip. So if you want to start to keel and go to International Falls or Ashland, Wisconsin, how do you do it? 
there's some tools out there, but we think that uh, our program is going to help people do that a lot, as well as manage it, that type of deal. It's what we call trail town. And then road and trail inconsistency, which is what you'll find. I'm really glad to read your guys' uh, ordinance, that it pretty much follows 2333, with the exception of what I saw is the age and driver's license and insurance, which we see in a lot of places. But the inconsistency between trails and routes, and then routes in one city or town and routes in another city and town. I was just working with up north Polk County. Uh, so Polk County, uh, the county just passed an ordinance themselves and they're trying to get 17 townships to go back and adopt the county ordinance. So all 17 townships in that county have a consistent ordinance. So that's something that we're hopeful will continue to develop so that the rider knows you know, in some places they got hours of operation, uh, times of operation, season of operation, that kind of stuff. So just want consistency. And then our concern is the open intoxicant. Uh, I'm sure you all discussed this. Um, as I mentioned, an ATV, a boat, a snowmobile are recreational vehicles. They're not motor vehicles. So there's some variance there. Uh, we really are pushing hard to try and get a, a statewide ordinance on open intox. Uh, we've got, I think, six or seven counties that have now done that. You can, I didn't see that address in yours, but again, it, it's not a problem until it becomes, you know, a problem, but that's where our ambassadors and our clubs really come into play to help, help keep that down. So that last bullet point there, motor vehicles and recreational vehicles have differences. Um, so that's some of the, the pros and cons there. Um, I guess Adam and I are available afterward. Again, kind of big picture stuff. Uh, I have no idea if anybody in the city and the surrounding area is interested, uh, but we are always available for follow-up uh, calls and meetings. And for us, it's unique that we can go to Keel versus Ashland, Wisconsin. Uh, we're actually the regional folks, Adam and I, in this area. So Adam, did you have anything else you wanted to add? No, not at this time. Okay, and Chief and, and uh, everybody, is there any question for me? Otherwise, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, I don't got any questions. Do you want to stay on for my part of it, too? Sure, absolutely. Okay. Um, I will see if I can just share my screen instead. <coughs> hey, Chief, before you do that, I just want to make sure, because you said you're recording this. Yep. We don't see it being recorded on our Zoom. Is it recording there? Uh, we have it recording on an iPad, so yeah, it's recording. It's just okay, perfect. Not for, not <laughs> just, for Zoom. Okay, just checking. So, Adam, do I need to do the stop share then? Yes. Oh, you just did? No. What is that? There you go. I'll do it here. Okay. All right, there you are. Um, <coughs> I don't know if I can share mine. I guess we'll see. There we go. All right. <clears throat> I don't know what I just did here. Sorry, I wasn't looking at the TV. <laughs> All right. All right. I assume most of you guys know this, and for the record, most of this is plagiarized from the DNR's uh, um, slideshow. So, ATVs, commercially manufactured, 900 pounds or less. The seat is a straddle type seat and designed to travel on three or more tires. Yes, I forgot. Anybody remember the old uh, <coughs> free wheeled uh, ATVs? <coughs> uh, max width of 50 inches, so that is not legal because of the tires on there. So, UTV, it must have a roll bar, can't be more than 65 inches wide, under 3,000 pounds, has to have a steering wheel, four tires, tail and brake light, and two headlights. 
Yeah. So this is what some of the things it doesn't include. Uh, track vehicles are don't aren't included at all. And this is all 2333. This is all the state law stuff. So none of this is any of the keel specific stuff yet. So uh, the one in the top right, I think, is just too wide. I'm not really sure why that one's illegal. Because I see a headlight, maybe it doesn't have any taillights. I see one maybe, but I don't know. Uh, or these, uh, we'll get into golf carts later, but the other ones on there are, in, are no. Um, most of you should be familiar with the guys that ride them off in the trails. Uh, there are no trails in Kiel, so any law stuff you see referring to ATV trails don't apply here at all. All of the streets you'll be on will be designated as ATV routes. So that's a highway. Uh, forget sidewalk because there's not a lot of the sidewalks unless you're snow plowing. So and these, this is some of the marking you'll see, like Trempolo counties, basically all their county highways are ATV routes unless they're not. You're gonna see more of the ATV road signs. I don't know if we have any arrow signs up though. I think we posted them on where they start, like off 67. Kind of show that you can't go on 67, but you can cross it like at Persnickety, Buenos or Channel or something like that. So. All right, this is the regular state law. You can't operate on any highway and any highway includes any it's the state definition of a highway, which is basically any paved road that's used for motor vehicle traffic. So, but unless it's a road, and most of our city streets will be roads, so you shouldn't have to worry about that. Um, that is a guy who this is was taken by a DNR officer. Um, I don't know what he was doing, but he made him walk at home instead of uh, driving. So. <laughs> I'm not really sure. I actually think he's on a road that isn't wasn't designated as a route, so he can't ride it anymore, so he's got to push it back to where he's got to go. All right. ATVs can only operate down the roads, crossing the bridge, um, and they must come to a complete stop and yield to any vehicle traffic or pedestrians. Basically like a car. Uh, when you're on the road, you got to stay on the... Let me see. Can't pass other motor vehicles. Can't ride on areas intended for passengers. Can't ride on areas not intended for passengers. So, no standing on bumpers, that kind of thing. And some of this is not going to apply to us. Like the 12 to 15 year olds must be accompanied by an adult because we have our ordinances 16 and older with a driver's license. And you must operate on the extreme right side of the road in single file, so no doubling up. And you can't be right near the center line. You gotta be all the way off to the right. And you gotta signal your turns. So if you don't have blinkers, that means uh, relearn your hand signals for when you're driving a bike, so. All right, um, here's a bunch of guys. They're actually riding legally. Um, but just kind of keep in mind, the picture is put in there because of all the other traffic that's actually gotta go in the oncoming lane to go around you. got to be registered. This one's got a private and agricultural tag as well as a regular one. Um, you guys should know where they need to be mounted. I think it's one on each side, correct? And somewhere visible on the, on the machine, right? Front fender. Front fender? Yeah. And you also got to have a registration plate on the back. Um, according to what the DNR said, there's little kits you can buy that have the little plates and you can put the numbers on. I'm not really sure. Yep. But that's the um, state statute required dimensions for them. So what's wrong with this one? Nothing. It's got the plate on there. They just have it blocked out. Or, and it's got to be readily visible from the rear. A lot of people put them in down there or up on the back by the rope up there. Okay. And I'm not sure what the placements. I think it could be it. Okay, do your research where you put it, but yeah, I just know it has to be visible from the rear, so. Um, you gotta be all the traffic signs you see in town, speed limit, stop signs, yield signs, all that good stuff. Um, 
Same thing as a motor vehicle, you can't operate at unreasonable speeds, you can't operate in a careless or reckless manner, uh, you can't operate on private property, um, and you can't operate without the permission of the owner of SC or public property in areas where it's prohibited. Forget about, well, you, the DNR safety certificate is also a requirement by state law. Um, so we also, because we adopted all of 2333, that's a requirement for us as well if you're born after January 1st of 88. So the clarification on that, that even if you're over 16, you, you still, still have, have to, to get take that. that. I didn't want to, I didn't want to say that, so you can say that. <laughs> I don't care, just don't worry about that. Forget about the 12 to 15 stuff, you gotta be at least 16. Same thing, you still need your safety certificate. Helmet requirements, state statute and our ordinance uh, require anybody under 18 to have a DOT certified helmet. So no bike helmets. Uh, it's not required for egg use or hunting or fishing, but I can't imagine there's a, be an argument for hunting or fishing in the city. So, or egg use for that matter. There's a good question, car seats. Can you put a car seat in the UTV and call it good? No, I don't think so. Nope, you gotta have a helmet on that kid. They don't need a car seat, but they need a helmet. So, so that is correct, but I think the helmet's probably a little big for the kids, but at least it's a helmet. Uh, one ups and two ups, are you guys familiar with the law that got passed, I think, last year regarding you can't ride two up on a machine designed as a one up vehicle? It has to be factory. It's got to be factory designed for two people, like the one on the bottom there. Um, so, those trunks that you strap on there with the backrest so you can put two people on there, that's not legal unless it's designed for two people out of the factory. Lighting requirements, one headlight taillight for UTV or ATV, two headlights, one taillight, one brake light for UTV. Um, they gotta be on all the time. You can't have them off during the day. And there's the lighting requirements as far as visibility is concerned. Most of these probably have LEDs, so it's not a big issue anymore. None of that's legal, so just when you see that, it might look pretty, but you can't have that on, at least on the road. Um, injuries and fatal crashes. This is state law is a little different than we have a city ordinance that requires that all crashes be reported to the police department. So even um, even just property damage only ones needs to, would still need to be reported to us. So um, death and injury, those are we probably call the DNR and actually handle those because we don't have a ton of experience with those kind of crashes. Um, and you're required to file a written report to the DNR within 10 days. Uh, we have our own crash report that we will do. For the ones that are not reportable, which would be the property damage ones, we can check ours non-reportable and those reports don't go anywhere. They don't go to the DNR or anything like that. We just we just need to have something reported just for our ordinance. So. so crash data, I don't know if you really care about that. Here's our city fuel specific regulations. 7.05 is ATV UTV and 7.06 is golf carts. I don't know if anybody's looked at those. Some of you are probably familiar with it, but it's on the website right now. You should be able to see it. Main ATV points, um, they're only allowed on roads that are, have a posted speed limit of 35 miles an hour or less, which means 67 you cannot operate on. You can cross it, but you can't drive on it north or south at any point. Um, we are required them to have a valid probationary or regular driver's license and be at least 16 years of age and they have to be registered. Um, that means occupational licenses uh, would not be um, good to have. You need to have an actual regular or probationary license. Um, it must have a DOT approved helmet and must be insured with liability insurance to the same requirements as a regular motor vehicle. And if they're equipped, they have to, you have to have your seatbelts on if you're equipped with them. Headlights gotta be on or off, 
Anything not able to reach at least 25 miles an hour for ATVs and UTVs at that slow moving vehicle triangle. Uh, no operation on any sidewalk, pedestrian walkway, jogging path, greenway, park, or trail. So any of the walking trails in town, they're off limits. You can't go on them at all. Okay. Uh, no operation on any city owned property either, so no tooling around any of the city parks. So um, Hingis Park would be the only exception on the paved portion, but um, not through the grass and stuff like that. So uh, can't be used as a taxi cab or commercial carrying of passengers or hauling freight. So you can't start your own UTV Uber service. <laughs> All right, or DoorDash for those of you that want to do that. Uh, just says uh, we've adopted 2333 that has all of the basic rules of the road for ATV UTV and it also has a lot of the equipment requirements and standards um, as far as like headlights taillights muffler decibel levels that kind of thing so and uh, the administrative code natural resource 64 as well and when you do park it it's got to be parked in the same way as a regular motor vehicle so you just got to park it parallel like, like you would a car and golf, anybody here a golf cart guy or are you guys all UTV, ATV? Okay. Don't kill the messenger because there's some stuff here you're probably not gonna like, okay? Um, are allowed on any highway in the city that has a speed limit of 25 or less with the following exceptions. They're not allowed on any state highways, okay? That means East Water Street, 7th Street, Fremont Street. Um, they're not allowed, actually, the first street between the little bridge, actually, too. Uh, we're not we're kind of going to look the other way with the first street bridge just to let the people in that subdivision so they're able to access the rest of town um, we'll see how that works um, but not on any number of highway they can't be on at all main streets mm -hmm. off limits which street main street yep three Fremont streets off limits you have to cross at one of the intersections and that's all you can do same thing, you're required to have a probationary or regular driver's license and be at least 16 and have to have the same insurance requirements as a car. Um, they can only be driven during the day unless they have an op two operating tail lamps and a headlamp and then you're allowed to go one half hour before or one half hour after sunrise and sunset. So after dark, you can't have those out. And they can't be operated during snow conditions, anything else where it's not visible. So there's your state highway crossings, 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, and 6th. We're mainly looking at in St. Paul Street. Those are the ones that directly meet each other as far as roads go. Um, a lot of the ones on 7th are offset, so you, you'd have to actually turn on to 7th Street before you can turn again, so you can't use those. So, question? Yeah. What's the story up by Dollar General's parking lot to get to access to the Piggly Wiggly? There is no way a golf cart would be able to get there because well, Park Avenue is 35 miles an hour. What's the reasoning for singling out golf carts from <coughs> Main Street and Seventh Street just because of the state highway? That's a state law, actually. There, there's something with the state law with those. That's, okay. Okay. Now, same with 67. There's no access to Quick Trip from Dollar General's parking lot. Like if you were just right like McDonald's, you wanted to cross 67 and go over to the hardware store, quick trip. On a golf cart? Uh, yeah. Um, you would be able to cross 67 at the service road entrance. That would be where you get access over there. Okay. Same thing with, um, <coughs> if you wanted to get the Piggly Wiggly, you'd, I can't give you permission to go through a private parking lot, but if you wanted to access it through yeah. Dollar General, that's that would be the way to go. Um, they haven't said no to that, but we didn't ask for permission either. So we did it. You guys saw us do it. No big deal, right? It, until they complain, we're not going right? to. Unless they complain, we're not going <clears> to <throat> do anything about it. It's no different than any, everybody else yeah. that goes We're through Dollar General to get the McDonald's and stuff like that. So, In terms of access to the frontage road, to go through like Riverview's parking lot. That's, a, that's another same. Same can of worms as Dollar General. You scream and yell, then you might have to do something. Yep. The, um, the preliminary indication from Jamie Ollie was that both owners were okay with it as long as people don't start doing stupid stuff. Mm -hmm. Understood. So, 
And the other one I got a question in regards to, is there anything going to be looked at in terms of the people who live in Rockville? Not that it affects me, but I'm saying there's a lot of people, you know, to let's say from maybe Rockville Tavern into Keel make some sort of an exception that eight that golf carts can run that distance? Right now, not that I know of, that would be something that the city would have to look at, maybe lowering the speed limit there. Because at, at 35, it's not low, so. Many years ago, there was 25, when it was Emily's Hill. That's, you know, that, that's out of my control if the city would have to set up the speed limits through there. I remember that. <laughs> there may be some conjunction with the township that, that would have to get worked on too because that's a dual jurisdiction highway through there, so. Yeah, that was one, again, I don't have a golf cart either, but I know there's people with concerns. Uh, the township of Schleswig has had, since what, 2015, ATVs and UTVs, and I don't see anything in their ordinance that restricts golf carts. So if Schleswig has already adopted the okay for golf carts on their roads, and I don't think they're well, talking about a 35 mile hour speed limit uh, restriction, like Cemetery Road from 57 to Rockville, I believe that you can legally drive a golf cart on that right now today. So now, so See, now I'm, Keel, I'm saying you can't. Now can. comes in, so you, you say no, you can't. Because you know, so golf we'll, carts aren't ATVs, they're a totally different animal. That would, that would allow the whole subdivision of Rockville to get out and get out to like at least Rockville Bar or the whole township of Schleswig. Sure. <laughs> and I know it'd be a long ride around, but once you're in the township of Schleswig, you could go up Steithall Road to Fish and Game Road, to Fish and Game Road to Sixth uh, Street, and come back into Keel and legally cross there. Well, so I think for the time being, at least let's go with what we have, and then well, we, I agree. You know, we start, I agree. start going to the, the, the council. That's, yeah, that's something that needs to get talked to right. with the alderman. Yeah. I got to enforce so people that write the laws of our city. Less wing enforcing it. Yeah. People to ride a, a golf cart, yeah. then the people in the Rockville subdivision could legally come out right now. <clears throat> See, and I don't think so. Uh, my my view is you can't just because there is it's a shared highway, so we have some say on what goes yeah, on. I don't, that I don't know whose rules. Or see the other ones. So I just like I said, I don't have a golf cart. But yeah, I know and especially Rockville, I've got to own almost all of that now. But there's only a couple houses that are out, so or we don't own it, but most of that's all annexed in, at least between cemetery and the rest of the city proper. So I got one more thing in the golf cart thing with the main drag. Are we able to cross? You can cross. Grade on in any, any, I guess I want to. Yeah, first, second, yeah, third, fourth, fourth, fifth, sixth, and sixth. Well, and you want to go straight, yeah, the ones that where the intersection actually lines up with each other, like like those. Straight shot. Yep, that's where the, like, the 7th Street ones, because they're all kind of weirdly and offset. In other terms, so I know, so you're saying off limits totally, so if you wanted to park in front of a business. That'd be a problem, yep. On a main drag with a golf cart, that's bad. Yep parked in your backyard, that'd be different. That would be. We have the municipal lot back there. Or the, back nearest, there. the nearest road that's legal. Or the, or the nearest side street, yeah. Nothing says right. you can't park right. on 6th Street or 5th Street. <coughs> Okie dokie. That's just the whole don't kill the messenger back, thing. <laughs> yes. Last step back to ATVs. Yeah. For about 67 north and south, you can't go any distance on it north and south? Nope. That's another so you're cross. saying nobody can take a four-wheeler uh, Laura company? the way it's written and that that was the state that that came down hard on 67 because we negotiated that with them and they, they said no. Was 45 too, but. I, I don't know I don't have one I'm just telling you that that's the that's just the way the law is written right now and that's the way the ordinances are written so and golf 
Shortcuts are the same as uh, ATVs, UTVs, can't use any sidewalks, trails, jogging paths, anything like that. Or be on any property owned by the city without either my written consent or the DPW foreman. Um, seating capacity can't be exceeded and nobody can be standing while it's in operation. Quick question, so um, helmet laws for golf carts? Are there aren't any. Okay. The, the helmet law came out of basically out of the state statutes for the helmets. Yeah. So. I was just, I don't want to be driving the kids around and all set up. So. As far as I'm aware, there isn't anything. Um, that, And I went through the ordinance pretty hard when I was writing this thing up, and there isn't any requirement that I saw. So. Same thing with the Uber DoorDash stuff, you can't do that, and you gotta be parked just like a regular car with your golf cart. That's all I got. I was a lot faster than the, <laughs> than the association. I have a question about, uh, this would be for you, DBs. Has if the city or, uh, are they still on for Wisconsin TVs? I think they're still on. You guys still on? So, yep, 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 we're here. Has anybody gotten a hold of either VB mapping or <clears throat> Blair's ride command to let them know that the entire city is going to be a legal route now so that our GPSs and our Blair's ride commands show that? I'm, I'm sorry, we're having trouble hearing that. Can somebody repeat no, that? I'm, I'm, he wants that to know if the, maps are, the right command maps and those kind of maps that are on yeah. the UTVs will be updated. Oh, who gets a hold of Jeremy at VV Mapping to let him know that the city and, and which streets are actually open and legal so that the, the, the application or the apps get updated? Yeah, we, we have a working relationship with Jeremy. Uh, all of our trail data comes from him. Uh, so once the signs are up and everything's open, uh, we'll pass that on to him to get into his system. Perfect. That's good. As far as ride commands, we don't have a connection with Polaris in that regard, so it'll be up to one of their um, one of their guys to do it. benefit for this for allowing this bring this into you know when they approach you what is your benefit as a police department or a city of Kiel? Well, I'm just a good soldier and do what I'm told um, I just remember a lot of people being at the meeting including you there was some there's a lot of interest and a lot of interest a lot of people have them um, we're almost on an island I think there's one township that does not allow them but being on an island, um, it really helps our businesses. We have a lot of restaurants here, so there's a lot of people that love to ride their ATVs. Yeah, I that understand work that to, uh, as businesses, the new business owners, yeah. but the city, the police department, the city, what is there? Well, I think the citizens the, that want it, right? I mean, that's it, and to promote local businesses as well, or help them promote themselves. So, okay. I think he's right, but Keel is, is pretty much an island. Yeah. I mean, yeah. the whole state opened up, and pretty much yeah. all of Cali Bay County. Sheboygan County is a bit of an issue, but now Manitowoc, I'm hearing, is getting a bunch of new routes and stuff, and I think the township of Ryan is probably going to be a little bit of an issue for, who knows, maybe forever, but, I mean, the connectivity between one county and the other is getting closer and closer, and if we could do one, one of his rides, like he called, you know, where you get together, and it also, wherever the benefit of it is, it, it takes away the confusion of people who are driving in those other ones and they come into our city and they get to meet the police chief because it's not allowed and now you know it should hopefully open that up i personally you know, picking my out. case for having an organization <laughs> and that's why you can get that network out to get that kind of information so yeah. just consider that we'd love to help you do it I just want to remind everybody with the ATVs, UTVs too. I'm not. I don't know. Just be careful when you leave the city because I'm not sure what their rules are depending on whatever road you're on. I think Manitowoc County is pretty. They have a pretty hard line on allowing them on the county trunk highways, the lettered ones. So just keep that in mind when you do leave town that you don't get in trouble that way. So this might sound like a silly question, but. Where 
where you can go and where you can't. So I, I understand you can't take a UTV on 67 because it's 45 miles an hour. If I'm coming down Park Avenue, the truck route, where do I have to stop? And because the roundabout itself, the speed limit is what, like 50? It's 45, yeah, it's technically 45, so. In the roundabout? In the roundabout. So the yellow roundabout. signs are recommended speeds, they're not actual official speeds, so. Okay, so if I'm coming down Park Avenue, and I want to get to Rockville, do I have to get off, go through the parking lot by Dollar General, cross by Quick Trip? Yes, that's the technique. Yeah, that would be the I, solution. I can't just go around half of the round No. no. Not, legally. not legally, legally anyway, yeah. Well, I know, I realize that, but. Now, you had, I saw a map. I don't know if it was on Facebook or whatever, but are you going to publicize that map, you know, and put it all over in businesses around? I don't know. That, that would be up to the city administrator or. Okay. Yeah. You know, I think put that open and everybody stand yeah. so they can it's see that, you know, or as well. put it under your TV or golf I cart or whatever. I know this, I don't know what the city has published for maps already. They might have something done. They've, they've created, created, that, they've created, created the two that I posted on them. Sure, yeah, absolutely. Those were the maps that were on Facebook. From the city. From the city, did they already? Okay. Yeah, I've seen two of them. One of them that showed where we could cross. And I've seen those, yeah. I don't know if they've actually reproduced those in numbers and be able to distribute them. They print them off from the smaller ones. So that's why I asked the question of the ride command. Yeah. You can turn your GPS on. It's going to tell you whether you can ride there or not. I didn't know those ride command stuff did that. That's actually kind of nice. Yeah, you can download VD mapping for, it's only 10 bucks a year for your renewal once you get it. you if you're on a route or not and oh, kind of nice. it goes on because any old gps any duty or garmin gps oh. i mean we carry them in our utvs all the time you can tell if you're on a route or not okay sure <clears throat> that's the city it's pretty good because we've got a weird thing right off of park avenue that's actually not considered in the city it's a property that's not just here that was kind of my scam Start somewhere, and this is where we started. So, is there a, yeah, is there a time limit, like night wise? For ATVs? No. Just the golf carts. So, and then, even if you've got something to 
stuff with LED lights yeah. that look like a UFO going on or on. It makes no difference. It's sunrise to sunset. So I'm not sure where that came from. I'm sure we, I'm sure uh, the city administrator had a ton of ordinances around the state and kind of just melded everything. So big thing is just make sure if anybody that's born after 88 has to take that safety class, even if they have a driver's license. But born after 88, they still have to have that safety class. So we were going to talk with. Um, I think so. Somebody told me they took it online. Yeah. <coughs> Can you take it online? Yeah, I guess. Yeah. 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 When I took it, I had to go and drive around and catch the and stuff like that. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, you got a big bike. No, that was the, when I took it with the fire department. When they oh, had that's right on it. Out on a fishing game or something. Yeah. 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 Of course. Right. Yeah. Yes, sir. Which part of Miller Road? Like from 67. Yeah. To east of east of 67. Yeah. That's another dual jurisdiction, so we have jurisdiction over that, so that would be no, because we we can enforce both sides of that road. We can ride on that road. No. It's 55. It's 55. It's, it's because it's 55. No, east of. East of it. Oh, west you're fine. Yeah, because it's 25 there. Okay. But east of, or east of it is actually a route. I don't know. Is it? Yeah. yeah, yeah so you it's it to oh, I didn't know. Then right? forget yeah. what I said. <laughs> like I said, I don't drive. So. Five layer and <laughs> so you can't cross the highway fifty-seven. I don't know. I would assume not because there's nowhere to cross. There's no cross to double. Yeah, you have to jog somewhere, so you wouldn't be able to do that. Well, we have a we have a citywide a public protection. You guys talking about going to and from bars? This is going to be important. Yeah. The um, remember when he was talking about the open intox yeah. laws and stuff like that? Um, we actually have a um, open intox and public ordinance already, which would cover this. So, so they you yeah. can't have open open containers while you're operating these things as a uh, operator or passenger. So. How does straw? <laughs> How does OWI laws work? In, I'm not saying that's important, but a lot of people get ATVs, boats, all this stuff combined. You think it goes against your normal driving record as well? Is it or no? As of right now, no. Um, they still have their. There's a separate ATV, UTV, OWI law um, that can. It works almost the same as a. It doesn't go on your driving record. Right. But second and more uh, subsequent offenses are all crimes, just like they are as uh, with a car. So people are just wondering. You know, people always ask that question because it's always so, it's such a. That is something I would expect to change probably with the proliferation of these things. That you know, people are going to want the same penalties in place regardless of what you're driving yeah, on the road. So checkpoints on you know, trails nowadays. You know, I pull people over and check them and stuff, but I. I still think snow bills that don't go against no. normal. No, no, no. But they've been pushing, pushing for that the last year. I think the argument would be stronger 
for pushing it, but just when they're with ATV, UTVs, when they're, especially if they're operating on the roadway, I think what you'd no. see is like, because there are some of the 346, which covers your motor vehicles that do apply to ATVs and UTVs. There's a list of them. I don't know which ones they are because it was a long list, but I could see OWI getting added to that if you're on a roadway. I could see it happening. It's just, yeah. I, I just see it happening in the future. They're working hard to get a change. Are, are they? Yes. Okay. And I, I don't, I don't see anything wrong with that. I think you're just as deadly in an ATV as you are in a car. So. Is getting a change. Oh, no. Are we all done? <laughs> i got to go home and shovel. Thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Most of you have my email, otherwise I can pop up the first uh, slide again. I'll share your... I'll share your... Uh, <laughs> Joel's on the joint. Is there any... We were given a hard no by the mainly because of how the road's designed, because there's no shoot on it, and there's, and you can't operate in that center lane, that's your turn in your lane, so. Some people, some people are thinking around that. I know, but you know what I mean. I know what you mean. That's why, there is no, there is no way to get around. Okay, I just told her, I know there's at least six or eight, if not ten. Like, I'll go to a meeting just to add 